<laughs> Good afternoon, everybody. Today, in observance of Black History Month, I'm reading a short story by Chimamanda Ngozi Adichie, entitled The Arrangers of Marriage, from her collection The Thing Around Your Neck, published in 2009. Although the title refers to marriage arrangement, the story is also very much about the experiences of black immigrants to the United States. Adichie is a Nigerian author and feminist who is best known in the US for her novel Americana, which won the National Book Critics Circle Award in 2013. She was born in Enugu, Nigeria to a large ethnic Igbo family and lived most of her early life in Nsukka, Nigeria, where her father was a statistics professor at the University of Nigeria and her, father was, and her mother was the first female registrar. At age 19, she left Nigeria to study in the United States, earning a bachelor's degree from Eastern Connecticut State College and two master's degrees, one from Johns Hopkins University in creative writing and the second from Yale University in African Studies. She has since been the recipient of several fellowships, including a Hodder Fellowship at Princeton University from 2005 to 2006, a MacArthur Fellowship in 2008, and a fellowship to study at the Radcliffe Institute of Advanced Studies at Harvard from 2011 to 12. She's also the recipient of several honorary degrees. Adichie's body of work includes three novels, including Americana, a novella, Zikora, just recently published, two essay collections, a poetry collection, a play, and numerous pieces for publication from publications such as The New Yorker and The New York Times, for which he recently reviewed Barack Obama's newly published memoir, A Promised Land. She writes primarily about the immigration experience of black people the relationship between men and women, and the relationship between Africa and the United States. Aditya has said that race for her was never an issue until she emigrated to the United States and discovered what an issue it is in this country. Today, Aditya is married to a Nigerian physician, lives and works in America for six months of every year, and in Lagos, Nigeria, for the remaining six months. The Arrangers of Marriage. My new husband carried the suitcase out of the taxi and led the way into the brownstone. Up a flight of brooding stairs, down an airless hallway with frayed carpeting, and stopped at a door, the number 2B, unevenly fashioned from yellowish metal, was plastered on it. We're here, he said. He had used the word house when he told me about our home. I had imagined a smooth driveway snaking between cucumber-colored lawns, a door leading into a hallway, walls with sedate paintings, a house like those of the white newlyweds in the American films that NTA showed on Saturday nights. He turned on the light in the living room, where a beige couch sat alone in the middle, slanted, as though dropped there by accident. The room was hot, Old, musty spells, smells hung heavy in the air. I'll show you around, he said. The smaller bedroom had a bare mattress lodged in one corner. The bigger bedroom had a bed and dresser and a phone on the carpeted floor. Still, both rooms lacked a sense of space, as though the walls had become uncomfortable with each other, with so little between them. Now that you're here, we've got more furniture. I didn't need that much when I was alone, he said. OK, I said. I felt lightheaded. The 10-hour flight from Lagos to New York and the interminable wait while the American customs officer raked through my suitcase had left me woozy, stuffed my head full of cotton wool. The officer had examined my food stuffs, stuffs as if they were spiders her gloved fingers poking at the waterproof bags of ground agusi and dried enugbu leaves and uzisa seeds until she seared, seized my uzisa seeds. She feared I would grow them on American soil. It didn't matter that the seeds had been sun-dried for weeks and were as hard as a bicycle helmet. 
Ike Agunum, I said, placing my hand back down on the bedroom floor. Yes, I'm exhausted too, he said. We should get to bed. In the bed with sheets that felt soft, I curled up tight like Uncle Ike's fist when he is angry and hoped that no wifely duties would be required of me. I relaxed moments later when I heard my new husband's measured snoring. It started like a deep rumble in his throat, then ended on a high pitch, sounded like a lewd whistle. They did not warn you about things like this when they arranged your marriage. No mention of offensive snoring, no mention of houses that turned out to be furniture-challenged flats. My husband woke me up by settling his heavy body on top of mine. His chest flattened my chest. Good morning, I said, opening sleep-crusted eyes. He grunted, a sound that might have been a response to my greeting or part of the ritual he was performing. This was a thing the arrangers of marriage failed to mention. Mouths that told the story by sleep, expectations that I did not expect. His breathing rasped as he moved as if his nostrils were uh, too narrow for the air that had to pass through. When he finally stopped, he rested his body on mine, even the weight of his legs. I did not move until he climbed off me to go to the bathroom. Good morning, baby, he said, coming back into the room. He handed me the phone. We have to call your uncle and aunt to tell them we arrived safely. Join just for a few minutes. It costs almost a dollar a minute to Nigeria. Dial 011 and then 234 before the number. Ezioku? All that? Yes, international dining, the dialing code first, and then Nigeria's country code. Oh, I said, I punched in the 14 numbers. The phone line crackled with static, reaching out across the Atlantic. I knew Uncle Ike and Auntie Ada would sound warm. They would ask what I had eaten, what the weather is in America, but none of my responses would register. They would ask just to ask. Uncle Ike would probably smile into the phone, the same kind of smile that had loosened his face when he told me that the perfect husband had been found for me. The same smile I had last seen on him months before when the Super Eagles won the soccer gold medal at the Atlanta Olympics. A doctor in America, he had said, beaming. What could be better? Ophodila's mother was looking for a wife for him. She was very concerned that he would marry an American. He hadn't been home in 11 years. I gave her a photo of you. I did not hear from her for a while, and I thought they had found someone, but Uncle Ike let his voice trail away, let his beaming get wider. Yes, Uncle, he will be home in early June, Auntie Ada said. You will have plenty of time to get to know each other before the wedding. Yes, Auntie, plenty of time was two weeks. What have we not done for you? We raise you as our own, and then we find you in a Zigbo D, a doctor in America. It is like we won a lottery for you, Auntie Ada said. She had a few strands of hair growing on her chin, and she tugged at one of them as she spoke. I had thanked them both for everything, finding me a husband, taking me into their home, buying me a new pair of shoes every two years. It was the only way to avoid being called ungrateful. I did not remind them that I wanted to take the JAMB exam again and try for the university that while going to secondary school, I had sold more bread in Auntie Ada's bakery than all the other bakeries in Nugo sold, that the furniture and floors in the house shone because of me. Did you get through, my new husband asked? It's engaged, I said. I looked for a way so that he would not see the relief on my face. Busy, Americans say busy, not engaged, he said. We'll try later. Let's have breakfast. For breakfast, he defrosted pancakes from a bright yellow bag. I watched what buttons he pressed on the mic microwave, carefully memorizing them. 
Boil some water for tea, he said. Is there some dried milk, I asked, taking the kettle to the sink? Rust clung to the sides of the sink like peeling brown paint. Americans don't drink their tea with milk and sugar. Ezioku, don't you drink yours with milk and sugar? No, I got used to the way things are done here a long time ago. You will too, baby. I sat before my limp pancakes. They were so much thinner than the chewy slabs I made at home and bland tea that I feared would not get past my throat. The doorbell rang and he got up. He walked with his hands swinging to his back. I had not really noticed that before. I had not had time to notice. I heard you come in last night. The voice at the door was American. The words flowed fast and ran into each other. Supri, supri, Auntie Ify called it. Fast, fast. When you come back to visit, you will be speaking supri, supri like Americans, she had said. Hi, Shirley. Thanks so much for keeping my mail, he said. Not a problem at all. How did your wedding go? Is your wife here? Yes, come and say hello. A woman with hair the color of metal came into the living room. Her body was wrapped in a pink robe knotted at the waist. Judging from the lines that ran across her face, she could have been anything from six decades to eight decades old. I had, I had not seen enough white people to correctly gauge their ages. I'm Shirley from 3A. Nice to meet you, she said, shaking my hand. She had the nasal voice of someone battling a cold. You're welcome, I said. Shirley paused as though surprised. Well, I'll let you get back to breakfast, she said. I'll come down and visit you when you, you settled in. Shirley shuffled out. My new husband shut the door. One of the dining table legs was shorter than the rest. And so the table rocked like a seesaw, where he leaned on it and said, you should say hi to people here, not you're welcome. She's not my age mate. It doesn't work that way here. Everybody says hi. Oh, dear ma. OK. I'm not called off Odile here, by the way. I go by Dave, he said, looking down at the pile of envelopes Shirley had given him. Many of them had lines of writing on the envelope itself above the address, as though the sender had remembered to add something only after the envelope was sealed. Dave? I knew he didn't have an English name. The invitation cards to our wedding had read, Ophedile Emeka Udenwa and Chinaza Agath Akatha Okafor. The last name I use here is different, too. Americans have a hard time with Udenwa, so I changed it. What is it? I was still get, trying to get used to Odenwa, a name I had known only a few weeks. It's Bell. Bell? I had heard about a Wataruocha that changed to Waturu in America, a Chikalugo that took the more American-friendly Chikel, but from Udenda to Bell? That's not even close to Odenwa, I said. He got up. You don't understand how it works in this country. If you want to get anywhere, you have to be a mainstream as possible. If not, you will be left by the roadside. You have to use your English name here. I never have. My English name is just something on my birth certificate. I've been Chinaza Oka for my whole life. You'll get used to it, baby, he said, reaching out to caress my cheek. You'll see. When he filled out a social security number application for me the next day, the name he entered in bold letters was Agatha Bell. Our neighborhood was called Flatbush. That's where I grew up. My new husband told me as we walked hot and sweaty down a noisy street that smelled of fish left out too long before refrigeration. He wanted to show me how to do the grocery shopping and how to use the bus. Look around. Don't lower your eyes like that. Look around. You get used to things faster that way, he said. I turned my head from side to side so he would see that I was following his advice. Dark restaurant windows promised the best Caribbean and American food in lopsided print. A car wash across the street advertised $3.50 washes on a chalkboard nestled among Coke cans and bits of paper. 
The sidewalk was chipped away at the edges like something nibbled at by mice. Inside the air-conditioned bus, he showed me where to pour in the coins, how to press the tape on the wall to signal my, my stop. This is not like Nigeria, where you shout out to the conductor, he said, sneering, as though he was the one who had invented the superior American system. Inside Key Food, we walked from aisle to aisle slowly. I was wary when he put a beef pack in the cart. I wished I could touch the meat to examine its redness, as I often did at Okbete Market, where the butcher held up fresh-cut slabs buzzing with flies. Can we buy those biscuits, I asked. The blue packets of Burton's rich tea were familiar. I did not want to eat biscuits, but I wanted something familiar in the cart. Cookies. American called them cookies, he said. I reached out for the biscuits. Cookies. Get the store brand. They're cheaper, but still the same thing, he said, pointing at a white packet. OK, I said. I no longer wanted the biscuits, but I put the store brand in the cart and stared at the blue packet on the shelf at the familiar grain-embossed Burton's logo until we left the aisle. When I become an attending, we will stop buying store brands. But for now, we have to. These things may seem cheap, but they add up, he said. When you become a consultant? Yes, but it's called an attending here, an attending physician. The, the arrangers of marriage only told you that doctors made a lot of money in America. They did not add that before doctors started to make a lot of money, they had to do an internship and a residency program, which my new husband had not completed. My new husband had told me this during our short in-flight conversation, right after we took off from Lagos and before he fell asleep. Interns are paid 28000 a year but work about 80 hours a week. It's like $3 an hour, he had said. Can you believe it? $3 an hour. I did not know if $3 an hour was very good or very bad. I was leaning toward very good, until he added that even high school students working part-time made much more. Also, when I become an attending, we will not live in a neighborhood like this, my new husband had said. He stopped to let a woman with her child tucked into her shopping cart pass by. See how they have bars so you can't take the shopping carts out? In the good neighbors, neighborhoods, they don't have those. You can take your shopping cart all the way to your car. Oh, I said, what did it matter that you could or could not take the carts out? The point was, there were carts. Look at the people who shop here. They are the ones who immigrate and continue to act as if they are back in their countries. He gestured dismissively toward a woman and her two children who were speaking Spanish. They will never move forward unless they adapt to America. They will always be doomed to supermarkets like this. I murmured something to show I was listening. I thought about the open market in Enugu, the traders who sweet-talked you into stopping at their zinc-covered sheds, who were prepared to bargain all day to add one single Kobo to the price. They wrapped what you brought in plastic bags when they had them, and when they did not have them, they laughed and offered you worn newspapers. My new husband took me to the mall. He wanted to show me as much as he could before he started work on Monday. His car rattled as he drove, as though there were many parts that had come loose, a sound similar to shaking a tin full of nails. It stalled at a traffic light, and he turned the key a few times before it started. I'll buy a new car after my residency, he said. Inside the mall, the floors gleamed, smooth as ice cubes, and the high as the sky ceiling blinked with many ethereal lights. I felt as though I were in a different physical world on another planet. The people who pushed against us, even the black ones, wore the mark of foreignness, otherness, on their faces. We'll get pizza first, he said. It's one thing you have to like in America. We walked up to the pizza stand to the man wearing a nose ring and a tall white hat. Two pepperoni and sausage. Is your combo deal better, my new husband asked. 
He sounded different when he spoke to Americans. His R was overpronounced and his T was underpronounced. And he smiled, the eager smile of a person who wanted to be liked. We ate the pizza sitting at a small round table in what he called a food court. A sea of people sitting around circular tables hunched over paper plates of greasy food. Uncle Ike would be horrified at the thought of eating here. He was a titled man and did not eat at weddings unless he was served in a private room. There was something humiliatingly public, something lacking in dignity about this place, this open space of too many tables and too much food. Do you like the pizza, my new husband asked? His paper plate was empty. The tomatoes are not cooked well. We overtook food back home, and that is why we overcook food back home, and that is why we lose all the nutrients. Americans cook things right. See how healthy they all look. I nodded, looking around. At the next table, a black woman with a body as wide as a pillow, held sideways, smiled at me. I smiled back and took another pizza bite, tightening my stomach so it would not eject anything. We went into Macy's afterwards. My new husband led the way toward a sliding staircase. Its movement was rubbery smooth, and I knew I would fall down the moment I stepped on it. Biko, don't they have a lift instead, I asked. At least, I had once ridden in the creaky one in the local government office, the one that quivered for a full minute before the doors rolled open. Speak English, there are people behind you, he whispered, pulling me away toward a glass counter full of twinkling jewelry. It's an elevator, not a lift. Americans say elevator. Okay. He led me to the lift, elevator, and we went up to a section lined with rows of weighty looking coats. He bought me a coat the color of a gloomy day's sky, puffy with what felt like foam inside its lining. The coat looked big enough for two of me to snugly fit into it. Winter is coming, he said. It's like being inside a freezer, so you need a warm coat. Thank you. Always best to shop when there's a sale. Sometimes you get the same thing for less than half the price. It's one of the wonders of America. Asioko, I said, then hastily added, really? Let's take a walk around the mall. There are some other wonders of America here. We walked, looking at stores that sold clothes and tools and plates and books and phones until the bottoms of my feet ached. Before we left, he led the way to McDonald's. The restaurant was nestled near the rear of the mall. A yellow and red M the size of a car stood at its entrance. My husband did not look at the menu board that hovered overhead as he ordered two large no number two meals. We could go home so I can cook, I said. Don't let your husband eat out too much, Auntie Ada had said, or it will push him into the arms of a woman who cooks. Always guard your husband like a guinea fowl's egg. I like to eat this once in a while, he said. He held a hamburger with both hands and chewed with a concentration that furrowed his eyebrows, tightened his jaws, and made him look even more unfamiliar. I made coconut rice on Monday to make up for the eating out. I wanted to make pepper soup too, the kind Auntie Ada said softened a man's heart. But I needed the Uziza that the customs officer had seized. Pepper soup was just not pepper soup without it. I bought a coconut in the Jamaican store down the street and spent an hour cutting it into tiny bits because there was no greater and then soaked it in hot water to extract the juice. I had just finished cooking when he came home. He wore what looked like a uniform, a girlish looking blue top tucked into a pair of blue trousers that was tied at the waist. No, I said, did you work well? You have to speak English at home too, baby, so you can get used to it. He brushed his lips against my cheek just as the doorbell rang. It was Shirley her body wrapped in the same pink robe. She twirled the belt at her waist. That smell, she said in her phlegm-filled voice. It's everywhere, all over the building. What are you cooking? 
coconut rice, I said. A recipe from your country? Yes, it smells really good. The problem with us here is we have no culture, no culture at all. She turned to my husband as if she wanted him to agree with her, but he simply smiled. Would you come take a look at my air conditioner, Dave, she asked. It's acting up again, and it's so hot today. Sure, my new husband said. Before they left, Shirley waved at me and said, smells really good. And I wanted to invite her to have some rice. My new husband came back half an hour later and ate the fragrant meal I placed before him, even smacking his lips like Uncle Ike sometimes did to show Auntie Ada how pleased he was with her cooking. But the next day, he came back with a good housekeeping all-American cookbook, thick as a Bible. I don't want us to be known as the people who fill the building with smells of foreign food, he said. I took the cookbook, ran my hand over the cover, over the picture of something that looked like a flower, what probably was food. I know you'll soon master how to cook American food, he said, gently pulling me close. That night, I thought of the cookbook as he lay heavily on top of me, groaning and rasping. Another thing the arrangers of marriage did not tell you, the struggle to brown beef in oil and dredge skinless chicken in flour. I had always cooked beef in its own juices. Chicken I had always poached with its skin intact. In the following days, I was pleased that my husband left for work at six in the morning and did not come back until eight in the evening so that I had time to throw away pieces of hack cooked clammy chicken, and start again. The first time I saw Nia, who lived in 2D, I thought she was the kind of woman Auntie Ada would disapprove of. Auntie Ada would call her an Ashawa because of the see-through top she wore so that her bra mismatched shade glared through. Or Auntie Ada would have her prostitute judgment on Nia's lipstick, a shimmery orange, and the eyeshadow similar to the shade of the lipstick that clung to her heavy lids. Hi, she said when I went down to get the mail. You're Dave's new wife. I've been meaning to come over and meet you. I'm Nia. Thanks, I'm Chinaza, uh, uh, Agatha. Nia was watching me carefully. What was the first thing you said? My Nigerian name. It's an Igbo name, isn't it? She pronounced it Ibu. Yes, what does it mean? God answers prayers. It's really pretty. You know, Nia is a Swahili name. I changed my name when I was 18. I spent three years in Tanzania. It was amazing. Oh, I said and shook my head. She, a black American, had chosen an African name while my husband made me change mine to an English one. You must be bored to death in that apartment. I know Dave gets back pretty late, she said. Come have a Coke with me. I hesitated, but Nia was already walking to the stairs. I followed her. Her living room had a spare elegance, a red sofa, a slender potted plant, a huge wooden mask hanging on the wall. She gave me a Diet Coke served in tall glass with ice, asked how I was adjusting to life in America, offered to show me around Brooklyn. It would have to be a Monday, though, she said. I don't work Mondays. What do you do? I own a hair salon. Your hair is beautiful, I said. And she touched it and said, oh, this, as if she did not think anything of it. It was not just her hair, held up on top of her head in a natural Afro poof that I found beautiful, though. It was her skin, the color of roasted ground nuts, her mysterious and heavy-lidded eyes, her curved hips. She played her music a little too loud, so we had to raise our voices as we spoke. You know, my sister's a manager at Macy's, she said. They're hiring entry-level salespeople in the women's department, so if you're interested, I can put in a word for you, and you're pretty much hired. She owes me one. Something leaped inside me at the thought, the sudden and new thought, of earning what would be mine, mine. I don't have my work permit yet, I said. But Davis filed for you? Yes. It shouldn't take long. At least you should have it before winter. I have a friend from Haiti who just got hers. So let me know as soon as you do. Thank you. I wanted to hug Nia. Thank you. 
That evening, I told my new husband about Nia. His eyes were sunken in with fatigue after so many hours at work, and he said, Nia? As though he did not know who I meant, before he added, she's okay, but be careful, because she can be a bad influence. Nia began stopping by to see me after work, drinking from a can of diet soda she brought with her and watching me cook. I turned the air conditioner off and opened the window to let in the hot air so that she could smoke. She talked about the women at her hair salon and the men she went out with. I liked to listen to her. I liked the way she smiled to show a tooth that was chipped neatly, a perfect triangle missing at the edge. She always left before my new husband came home. Winter sneaked up on me. One morning, I stepped out of the apartment building and gasped. It was though God was shredding tufts of white tissue and flinging them down. I stood, staring at my first snow, at the swirling flakes for a long, long time before turning to go back into the apartment. I scrubbed the kitchen floor again cut out more coupons from the key food catalog that came in the mail, and then sat by the window, watching God's shredding become frenzied. Winter had come, and I was still unemployed. When my husband came home in the evening, I placed his French fries and fried chicken before him and said, I thought I would have my work permit by now. He ate a few pieces of oily fried potatoes before responding. We spoke only English now, he did not know that I spoke Igbo to myself while I cooked, that I had taught Nia how to say, I'm hungry, and see you tomorrow in Igbo. The American woman I married to get a green card is making trouble, he said, and slowly tore a piece of chicken in two. The area under his eyes was puffy. Our divorce was almost final, but not completely, before I married you in Nigeria. Just a minor thing, but she found out about it, and now she's threatening to report me to immigration. She wants more money. You were married before? I laced my fingers together before they had started to shake. Would you pass that, please, he asked, pointing to the lemonade I had made earlier. The jug? Pitcher. Americans say pitcher, not jug. I pushed the jug, pitcher, across. The pounding in my head was loud, filling my ears with a fierce liquid. You were married before? It was just on paper. A lot of our people do that here. It's business. You pay the woman, and both of you do paperwork together, but sometimes it goes wrong, and either she refuses to divorce you or she decides to blackmail you. I pulled a pile of coupons toward me and started to rip them in two one after the other. Oh, Fadile, you should have told me this before now. He shrugged. I was going to tell you. I deserved to know before we got married. I sank down on the chair opposite him, slowly as if the chair would crack if I didn't. It wouldn't have made a difference. Your uncle and aunt had decided. Were you going to say no to people who have taken care of you since your parents died? I stared at him in silence, shredding the coupons into smaller and smaller bits. Broken up pictures of detergents and meat packs and paper towels fell to the floor. Besides, with the way things are messed up back home, what would you have done, he asked. Aren't people with master's degrees roaming the streets jobless? His voice was flat. Why did you marry me, I asked. I wanted a Nigerian wife, and my mother said you were a good girl, quiet. She said you might even be a virgin. He smiled. He looked even more tired when he smiled. I probably should tell her how wrong she was. I threw more coupons on the floor, clasped my hands together, and dug my nails into my skin. I was happy when I saw your picture, he said, smacking his lips. You were light-skinned. I had to think about my children's looks. Light-skinned blacks fare better in America. I watched him eat the rest of the batter-covered chicken, and I noticed that he did not finish chewing before he took a sip of water. That evening, while he showered, I put only the clothes he hadn't bought me, 
two embroidered boo-boos and one kaftan, all anti aedas cast-offs, in the plastic suitcase I had brought from Nigeria, and I went to Nia's apartment. Nia made me tea with milk and sugar and sat with me at her round dining table that had three tall stools around it. If you want to call your family back home, you can call them from here. Stay as long as you want. I'll get on a payment plan with Bell Atlantic. There's nobody to talk to at home, I said, staring at the pear-shaped face of the sculpture on the wooden shelf. Its hollow eyes stared back at me. How about your aunt, Nia asked. I shook my head. You left your husband, Auntie Ada would shriek. Are you mad? Does one throw away a guinea fowl's egg? Do you know how many women would offer both eyes for a doctor in America? For any husband at all? And Uncle Ike would bellow about my ingratitude, my stupidity, his fist and face tightening before dropping the phone. He should have told you about the marriage, but it wasn't a real marriage, Janaza Nia said. I read a book that says we don't fall in love, we climb up to love. Maybe if you gave it time, it's not about that. I know, Nia said with a sigh, just try to be positive here. Was there someone back home? There was once, but he was too young and he had no money. Sounds really awful. I stirred my tea, though it did not need stirring. I wonder why my husband had to find a wife in Nigeria. You never say his name. You never say Dave. Is that a cultural thing? No, I looked down at the table mat made with waterproof fabric. I wanted to say that it was because I didn't know his name, because I didn't know him. Did you ever meet that woman he married? Or did you know any of his girlfriends, I asked? Nia looked away. The kind of dramatic turning of head that speaks, that intends to speak volumes. The silence stretched out between us. Nia, I finally asked. Yes, we slept together, almost two years ago, when he first moved in. And after a week, it was over. We never dated. I never saw him date anybody. Oh, I said, and sipped my tea with milk and sugar. I had to be honest with you, get everything out. Yes, I said. I stood up to look out of the window. The world outside seemed mummified into a sheet of dead whiteness. The sidewalks had piles of snow, the height of a six-year-old child. You can wait until you get your papers and then leave, Nia said. You can apply for benefits while you get yourself together. And then you'll get a job and find a place and support yourself and start afresh. This is the US of A, for God's sake. Nia came and stood beside me by the window. She was right. I could not leave yet. I went back across the hall the next evening. I rang the doorbell, and he opened the door, stood aside, and let me pass. <laughs>